Thanks for hosting Nobody Else Folk. Uh, I'd like to thank Slava and Chris for giving me the opportunity to talk about something which was theoretical and now will be reality, which is an experiment. <laughs> so for the last 10 years, we've been talking, or this group has, about a new experiment device we're going to be doing for studying anion cation collisions, at least one aspect of this. And this has been vaporware for many, many, many years. Uh, until this year, in principle, when we actually start to do something with it. So I'm going to talk about what we've done so far, why we've done what we've done, and what we plan to do, and how we are going to provide experimental data to motivate theorists to do some calculations. All right, so a lot of the experiments I will talk about, or at least give ideas about what we can do, cover many of the areas which this conference or this workshop is interested in. So interstellar space, flames, atmospheres and chunks of DNA. So we will be able to do reactions of these items with their positively charged and negatively charged, with other positively and negatively charged species, or with photons and do kind of many things. So there's a bunch of people involved, of course, because this is a big technical exercise. Uh, the cost of constructing this device is about $4 million, which is large for us, but pocket change for the Department of Energy but that's a big investment for Sweden. So the bunch of people over here in the second area are the ones responsible for building it. A bunch of people at the top are responsible for motivating science. And we have a few people who are also involved in terms of creating or making detectors that work in cryogenic environments. And also uh, Hanscom Air Force Base, which is no longer Hanscom Air Force Base. It's up the road. It's now Kirtland Air Force Base, which is in Albuquerque. So they're disappointed to move away from from civilization to Mexico. Uh, most of the funding comes from the Swedish Research Council. My personal interest, of course, is money which has come from Aldo Diano. So he's paying half my salary, so he gets some larger funds. So what I'm going to talk about, an overview of uh, my, my talk today, is iron storage links. Uh, also has relevance to the next talk, which is called the Crackle. And there are several, diff or two different main types of iron storage links. One which used magnetic fields to confine and define the orbit of the ions, and the second one is which, which uses electrolytic like elements. So I'm going to discuss some limitations and advantages of these two approaches. Desiree, what it is, so an overview of what we're trying to do. What can we do that is different and important? So what, what is the science which could not have been done before, which will now be possible, um, opportunities and possibilities, and the future, where are we now with Desiree? What's the current state? of our device. So it's a pretty simple overhead uh, in terms of like what the most instructive experimental technologies that as experimentalists we'd like to have. And as theorists you like experimentalists to say, well, this is what you have done and this is true. <coughs> so things like high ion beam energies and you know, good vacuum, these are the kind of things it's required to give low background. So background contributions to our measured signals, providing we can have high beam energy, you have a high, let's say, mega electron volt or even hundreds of kilo electron volt positive ion beam, the cross-section for collision with residual gas is small. So you don't lose your ions, plus contributions to your signals will be reduced because the cross-section is small. So these give you low background. The high energy, if you're colliding, uh, certainly in a merged beams configuration, let's say a megavolt, positive ion beam, if you want to do this reaction with the electrons to do dissociative combination, which Holt will concentrate more on, then if you work, work out the calculation, megavolt, positive ion beam, is you know, at least the kilovolt maximum electron beam. If you have a kind of a high energy electron beam, it's much easier to control the KV electron beam, you know, technically, and get high density. So these two go together, and of course, if you do merge beam configuration, you can get down to low center mass energy, which is the kind of thing which we've heard about several times today. So by low center mass, I think low center mass is below one electron volt, but easily you can go up to 100 electron volts or even higher, which of course covers a whole range of theoretical and of interest. And of course, because we're kind of parsimonious in Sweden, we don't like to throw away our money so easily, those ions that don't react on the first interaction, if we can be them, you know, and make sure that they go through the electrons again, then of course you get to save money. 
Of course, if you have samples which cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for a gram or something, then of course you've got them at use, use, most use of what you have. So that implies some kind of multipass, and the simplest multipass apparatus is a storage room. So all these things together give you ion storage rooms. So when we talk about ion storage, I mentioned my magnetic storage and electrostatic storage. If you look at the beam energy you get in a magnetic storage ring, it's defined basically by the bending power of your magnets. But what's also important is that the mass of the ion involved also comes into the expression. And if we talk about molecular ions, especially, they're usually singly charged, which makes, of course, the Q value here 1. And if you do the calculations, if you want to do the dissociated combination at 0 EV, I change the relative to leaf energy, Using Quiring as an example, the bending power is about 1.44 tesla meter. It gives you that the maximum mass for a single charge molecular ion that can still do dr at zero EV is about 100 a m. So it's not too. I mean, there's a lot of molecules which come under this, but if you want to start pushing things, then it gets quite crowded and quite difficult quite quickly. So several solutions: you can either increase the bending power of your magnets. For example, a new storage ring they're building in Manchu in China, they've increased their bending power to about 13 tesla meters. Now that makes a storage ring which may cost three or four million dollars into one which costs 30 or 40. So that's a big increase in cost. So a not really a huge increase in bending power. I mean, it's not even a factor of 10. So just using for magnetic storage, you can basically study small molecular ions but in good detail, because you have the resolution you can get down to these low collision energies. So basically you're looking at things like installer clouds, atmospheric, you know, atmospheres, O2, N2, these kinds of ions. And this, of course, has been the main interest in this combination. And there are several people in the audience, like and Steve, who have done high-level calculations on this combination of just these systems. So if we go to electrostatic storage, the mass dependence of the beam energy disappears. The only thing which is important is the charge of your species and you know, how much money you're prepared to put into your accelerating platform. So the negative side or the downside of this is that electrostatic power supplies or power supplies for purely electric elements, they do get quite expensive. So 100 kilovolts is usually kind of standard for like a few minutes, a million dollars or so. And of course, it gets more expensive the higher you go. And of course, there are quite a lot of technical requirements. However, there's no real mass limit to the ions that you can store. You could put you know, a highly charged piece of DNA or even a virus in that, but when you can get the thing into vacuum and it had enough charges, all that means is that 100 kV, this is fixed, multiplied by what the charge you have, the bigger they are, the slower they go, just like me. So <laughs> this is the kind of thing or the kind of approach that two new storage rings uh, that are currently being built, but there's several examples of uh, the electrostatic storage ring that have existed now for 10 years or so that uh, are currently under construction uh, that we will talk about today. One is CSI in Heidelberg, which I guess Holger will mention. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Desiree, which is another different approach using electrostatic elements. CSI will still study the social combination. They will have an electron target and they will be able to merge their electrons with their ions. So you'll be able to do DR under interstellar conditions. So cold and also two particles and so forth and so forth. And so forth. But we wanted to do a different approach because our funding agency told us that we don't want to do DR anymore, you have to do something different, so otherwise you get no money. So of course we threw the word bio into our application, they enjoyed that, and they gave us some cash. So we can now, because there's no last mass limit, the value you can charge these things up, and they get charged up usually in the body anyway, you put 15 or 20 protons on something which weighs 100 kilodaltons or so, and you know, you're down to something which basically weighs 10 kilodaltons or two. So stuff which can go in, you can do things with. So I put you to hold this talk, which you just have to mine, so there's no way you can escape. <laughs> so this is what we're doing instead. So our novel thing, was not to merge positive ions with electrons, or negative ions with electrons, but to merge positive ions with negative ions. So cation and ion collisions, one thing is neutral neutralization. So you can store ions in one ring, the opposite you charge ions in the other ring, and what's neat, of course, is one potential. So if you put 20 kilovolts or something on one of these deflectors, 
20 kilovolts will will decelerate with the plus 20, decelerate the positive ion beam, but also accelerate the negative ion beam. So in principle, one voltage gives you an effect on both beams. You change the voltage and you can play around with the So you can play around and do different things. So this is a picture of the facility, because it is a facility. Uh, the size of the vacuum vessel, uh, where all the interesting things happen, is about five meters by two and a half meters. So 15 foot by about eight foot. So. Um, it's built as basically a cryostat. So it's a double wall vacuum vessel where all the ion optics sit in the inner box. And it's all open optics, if you include the fact that well, they're shielded, of course, so the elements don't affect each other. So basically, they're all sat on a common base plate. And the common base plate is the one connected to the cold head of the cry generator, or in this case, four cry generators. So the idea is that we wanted to get this inner box down to about, about 10 Kelvin below. All the elements shrink together, of course, so the, you basically you find the orbit and the orbit moves nicely. The outer heat shield, so this is the, the second wall of the, the box, this is connected to the warmer stage of the cry generator. This should get down to about 60 K. So. The standard thing for creating iron storage devices, you have lots of pumps, you do lots of baking, and hopefully you should get down to pressures of around 10 to minus 13, 10 to minus 14 millibar room temperature. Because you know, things get colder, they move slower, pressure goes down. Number density is if things start sticking to elements, because once you get below 10 Kelvin, those sticking coefficients get quite high, so you can remove particles in some way that way as well. We have two iron source platforms, of course, one for negative ions, one for positive ions, or one for light ions, one for heavy ions, and associated iron traps and things like that, so you can pre-trap your ions, pull them down if they have no dipole moment, and then throw them in fixed traps. All right, so here's a, a picture of what's happening in the middle. You can do single ring experiments. These are the ELISA type experiments. So ELISA was the first of the, let's say, the new generation electrostatic storage rings built in Aarhus in Denmark, where they just have a single ring. So here you can throw your ions in, you let them circulate for a while, and now you can then interact them either with photons, or in the case of ELISA, they did have an electron target. So your ions can basically go in this ring or that ring, and basically then interact with photons over the merged section. So there's a whole bunch of things, of course, that you can do with these kinds of experiments. You can measure light and less stable ions, which are important both for astrophysics and also elsewhere, of course, and you redistributing clusters. This is another big topic, of course. You have a cluster which is cooled down. You throw, let's say, 10 to the 3 inside photons in there. How does energy get redistributed inside the cluster? So how many fragments get thrown away before, you, before energy, is, before the cluster basically settles down? So all these kind of things we can do. <coughs> what I'm going to focus on is what's unique and that's to make use of this merged double beam structure. So we can have our negative ions going in one ring, our positive ions going in the second ring, and of course, in this region here, the beam two beams will overlap. Of course, you have some charge, some mass, and some velocity of these beams. The merging section is about 0.8 meters, but it's cut up into various into a drift region, so there are different electrodes which we can basically couple to different voltages and basically play around with. But the idea is that we can control the collision energy between these two beams. Because of the fact that it's not entirely symmetric, we have some technical issues with the fact that we only have one voltage on this deflector here. And that voltage is fixed to make sure these ions in this ring go back in that ring. Of course, that's not the same voltage that these ions require to go back in their ring. So we have a second deflector here which basically corrects to the orbit of these ions in this ring. And that technically means that we have a maximum mass ratio of the ion that we can stop. So we have beam uh, in ring one at 100 kV and beam in ring two at about 5 kV, which is in principle the highest energy from that platform and the lowest energy from in principle that platform. The mass ratio, if we want to have a zero V collision, is about 3 to 1. So in principle, we could inject 100 kV neon plus, 5 kV H minus, and still get zero V collision. All right, so what do we want to learn in pictures? I'm a simple experimentalist, so I like to say to myself, what do I want to know? So how fast does my experiment go? Is it as fast as this Hummer, or as, sorry, wrong way around, as slow as this Hummer, or as fast as this snail? Okay, so how fast things go, of course, we've heard today, I mean, you, see, you need to know things like reaction rates. I mean, they're very important. How violent? So here is the correct way 
of making tea. <laughs> do you put, oh, I think this is a tea bag here. In principle, you put the loose tea in first, and then the hot water. You see these early people, they're just not doing it the right way around. You do not throw loose tea into the water. Wars have started over this. How complex? I mean, how many ways can this interaction go? I mean, is it as simple as one plus one is equal to two? I mean, do you even need to do the experiment? Can you know already what's going to go on? Or is it as complex as trying to fill out your 401 or your IRS? You know, there are whole ways in which you can do this. And then finally, how predictable? And I, I had trouble finding a picture for this one, and then I found this one. <laughs> is it as predictable as a full-on whitewash to the Detroit Tigers? Or is it what turns out a 4 0 whitewash to the San Francisco Giants? <laughs> so, can you predict what's going to happen in a reaction before you do it, or do you need to study what happens anyway? All right, so there's a whole bunch of stuff about why we will be doing things, because we need to put money into models, or data into models, but also to provide high quality data for theorists to do calculations. And of course, the reverse is not so true. If you have a high, you know, a very good potato energy surface, you can do some calculations on that surface and you can give predictions to experimentalists that this is what should happen in your experiment. All right, so I mentioned that we want to do this merge beam stuff. So here we have an experiment or an idea where we have some the light iron, the heavy iron, and some tuning voltage on our drift tube. This is the voltage we're going to use to slow down one beam and accelerate the other beam. So very simple. This is a, probably the, not the most complicated form I'm going to show, but almost. Uh, we have the kinetic energy of the ions in this region as a function of this tuning voltage. So clearly you can see that with QL being negative and QH being positive, one beam slows down, one beam speeds up. So you can play around with this tuning voltage. In one example here, if we have H plus H minus, positive ion, negative ion, the heavy beam goes in at 26 kV, the light beam goes in at 24, you can play around with the center of mass energy just with these numbers. And you can see if we sweep this drift voltage through one kilovolt, so one kilovolt on 24 is 25, one kilovolt on 26 is also 25, you can get down to sub milli EV or sub EV energies. And of course, now there are technical limitations what we can do. We should be able to get down to at least 10 milli EV reliably. All right. Now, for many years, we've been saying that we're building this experiment, it's coming soon, and like all good things, of course, you have to do other things whilst you're waiting for things to happen. So we can do calculations. I mean, we've been doing the social combination for many years, so we have some idea about how, what's important, what are the important parameters, experimentally speaking, that we need to do to get out things like cross-section. How fast is my reaction going? How many products? So the rate of a typical mode beam reaction is related to the current of the two beams, the relative velocity, the velocity of the beams, velocity of the current, some interaction region, some area of overlap between the two beams, and of course some cross-section. So a lot of these things, of course, we have experience with for many years. Of course, there's available literature and both other experiments for you know, typical currents, typical velocity, we know we can set the electrostatic supplies to. So what's really then critical is things like the overlap, the cross-section, and the largest beam. Now, of course, that's always nice as an experimentalist because you can play around with voltages and things and actually create some of these conditions. So before we go into this merging region, we can set voltages on these uh, elements such that we can define A, so that we make one beam always much larger in phase space than the other beam. So we have a big beam and a small beam goes through the middle of it. And then, of course, the interaction is then just defined by the size of the light of the two beams. We know what the size of our interaction region is because we can split up our drift tube into these elements. So the only thing which remains is some idea of the cross-section, and then we can get some idea of the rate out. So we can rewrite the rate in terms of things we know, you know, the two beams, currents, and of course the things that we don't yet know. But we can find ways of making these models. And if we take a H plus H minus, or anything where we're just transferring one electron, that's kind of a known problem for many, many years. It's a standard over the barrier transfer problem. And of course, there are many ways in which you can write these cross sections for these. Are, you know, we have impact parameters and maybe it's a closest approach. And we can always relate these to the kinetic energy of, of, let's say, the collision energy. So we have two regions where we have a small collision energy 
and another region where we have a large slave density. How the, the distance of coast approach relates to the impact parameter. So we can play around with these models. So we have some critical distance, which is you know, what is the, the shortest distance that ions get to approach, where the electron in principle now can hop over. So for H plus H minus, we have some calculations already made by Walsh Larson and her students, which show that the critical distance in this case is about 35 more radii. So we have an idea now for a critical distance, and we can stick these numbers in here and get cross-section, which looks something like this. So we have an idea now for the cross-section, which we can then stick in our little model as a put the clear energy to get out rate of reaction. So taking this example of H plus H minus again, sticking in numbers that we know we can get, 500 nanoamps of protons and 500 nanoamps of hydrogen of H minus, if we can't do that, we should quit the experiment. That's kind of a standard parameter. Uh, the beam energy we know, the area of, I said, the largest beam we can define from our ion optics, so that we know, and the smallest interaction length is actually seven and a half centimeters, which is one of these elements. And the critical radius, I say, 35 to 4 radii. So you can then convolute all this together and get a rate of reaction. The reason we do this is that if this rate of the reaction turned out to be one count a day, we would never bother going doing this experiment. That's too hard. We want numbers whereby we have hertz or tens of hertz of measurable rate. So we take the experiment, we're doing these fine as we sweep the voltage through one kilovolt, the center mass goes down to zero, and the rate goes up and peaks around two and a half thousand pounds per second. The reason why you have this odd form, of course, is that we never get really to zero EV collisions. Our geometry means that you have dispersion of the beams, so the smallest realistic energy we have is 10 million EV. So we have a distribution of energies which we then have to convolute, and that basically means we have the form of the planet. All right, so how are we going to measure these things? I mean, this, we, we can now measure the rate, because we know we can measure, we can change the voltage here, which means we change the collision energy. All we then do is measure these counts as a function of this collision energy, and we have a process. That's one thing which is important. The other thing which is important is how many things does it break up into? Okay, H plus H minus is kind of off, and then you only have two hydrogen atoms. So these two hydrogen atoms will be, will be moving forward, of course, because they, they have their kinetic energy, but they get some kick from this, from this interaction. Even with a zero lead to energy, you work out the energetics, and you have about, it's about uh, 10 electron volts or so of kinetic energy. So if this is given transversely, to the beam's direction, and of course, after some flight time, these atoms will separate. So you can make use of this separation by using the position of the detector. So you can throw some numbers in. You know the kinetic energy is usually on about 10 EV or so. The beam energy is 20 KV or so. We know the flight distance, at least, is on the order of a meter or so from the nearest element in the drift region to the detector. So we can put those numbers in, and for reasonable numbers, we get separations of 10 millimeters. So it's something which is kind of, kind of easy to measure. And of course, if you have two hydrogen atoms, one in the ground state, so let's say two in the ground state, and then one is internally excited to energy of two, that takes about 10 EV or so, 10 plus 2 EV. The energy has got to come from somewhere, which means the kinetic energy of your atoms is reduced. So their separation on the detector is small. So we have a way of differentiating between the different atomic excitation in our problem. So this is done using standard MCP and phosphor screen. You have a stack of three plates. Particles strike the plates. You get tiny electrons formed. This cloud gets accelerated to phosphor screen. You get a flash of light. You couple this light out from our ultra high vacuum and pain Kelvin out into the real world. We split the light into two. One is imaged onto a CCD camera, and the other is imaged onto a multi-anode PMT. So from the CCD, of course, if we have two hydrogen atoms, we should get two flashes on our detector. So from the CCD image, we can get the positions of these, and then from that, get the separation. We also have this multi-anode PMT. So 16 anodes, we image this phosphor screen onto that detector. So if one particle arrives on the left and one on the right, they will trigger different anodes. And then we can use the fact that they may arrive detected differently because of the way they broke up. You can get the time difference then between when these anodes were triggered. So we get both the arrival time difference and the positions. 
Here's an example again of H plus H minus. We form the two hydrogen atoms. One is always in the ground state. The other hydrogen atom can take any value of internal state up to n equals 4. There is actually enough kinetic energy to do that. So I then just did the calculations. I then worked out what my detected distribution of those atoms on the detector would be. If they're both formed in the ground state, then their separation turns out to be about 45 millimeters. Our detectors are about 70 millimeters. And of course, you then have the other two channels. So we will be able to see by looking at these separations, by measuring these distributions, what we have. Now, of course, as you see down here, there's a lot of overlap between these distributions, the separations of the two atoms. Because if we have our detector here, if they dissociate this way, or if they get their kick that way, then they have the maximum separation in space, but the shortest in time. If they dissociate or they get their kick this way, they have the smallest separation in space, but the largest in time. So we have to make use of both the time and the separation. So we take a slice. It was, I don't know, to look at particles which arrive within five nanoseconds, and then apply that to all the events you've got. You then take this and transform it into that. So now they are all well separated in space. So here's a bunch of stuff which we would like to do. So this is on the list of things which we were doing, uh, already decided in, like, in terms of experimental plans. So neutral neutralization. H plus H minus going to two hydrogen atoms. I've talked about this and I've given you some examples. But things like O2 plus plus O2 minus. There's enough energy in this to form four oxygen atoms and still have almost enough to have one electron of excitement. So you have multiple bomb breaking processes going on. C60 plus plus C60 minus, what happens here? You transfer one electron, do your C60 say boogie ball, or do they start throwing out C2 groups? Two-step reactions driven by electron affinity. For example, Br minus plus fluorine plus, going to Br plus plus fluorine minus. You look at the energetics involved in this, and the energy difference between these two transferring to the electrons is about 60 feet. So you can have an interruption where you know, rewrite that, you start coming in, you first transfer one electron, and as the system starts to evolve, you then transfer the second. This is kind of a funny thing. Cool. And in terms of what we can do with experimentalists, this would be a back to round three process. We could measure so F minus and BR, F plus and BR minus, uh, sorry, BR plus and F minus in coincidence. Because the rings are set up to store BR minus and F plus. If you change completely what you form, these will, of course, get bent out from their orbits, and we have detectors to pick up these charges to get back. One perfect example of this is H D plus or H plus plus D minus going to H minus plus D plus. Still a tricky theory. Molecular fusion, C60 plus, C60 minus going to C100. Things like investigating threshold chemistry, chemical reactions, seeing when bonds form and break. I think controlling which ones you break and form. So we take, for example, sodium plus and uh, phosphor oxide, uh, PO3 minus, the direct electron transfer channel, where you pop one electron over here, sodium is, exo is uh, endothermic by half a bit. This is not going to happen to zero release emissions. But you form some kind of internal complex between your sodium plus and your PO3 minus, where you can break and form bonds. This thing is exothermic by three degrees. So we'll be able to see exactly, by controlling the collision energy, how this turns to that, or even if this opens up. So lots of fun things to do. That will be the third experiment, because there is nice theory available, and it is half of this that it before. This is a picture of the lab, uh, which I took a few days ago. This is the 100 kV platform. These are the beam lines for injecting into the vacuum vessel, which is the great thing over here. This is the low energy platform beam line, there's a technical paper I wrote. On the bottom, we have some preliminary results. This is the negative ion source, which we stuck out for carbon-12, and we're getting 5 to 10 micrograms of 10 kV, C minus, C2 minus, and a whole bunch of stuff. So this, of course, is related, or the idea behind this, is related to the C, N, H minus, and ion, which uh, I guess were discovered locally in space, so or in clouds. So we want to do these anions, and we want to see neutral neutralization of these anions. When they, they're going to collide with probably C plus or acetylene plus, and what, what will happen, we have no idea. 
We have some uh, images from our first heart injection, which was about a few months ago, maybe four months ago now, from the image detector. You see the flash of light across the screen. From the nucleization of these carbon anions uh, with visual gas. Just by left, we finished baking our rings. Uh, 380 Kelvin for 24 hours. The reason why it's not hotter, and we usually people bake at you know, 450 Kelvin, is because we have our super insulation, which basically provides a lot of thermal shielding, starts to melt at 150 degrees C. So we have to keep the temperature of baking lower than that. Some results from our thermal, from our when we start to put the turn on our cry generators, just chilling out. So here we have 298 Kelvin, and we got down to 14 Kelvin in only 1.3 million seconds. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I should tell you about 15 days. Uh, so, you know, this is the coolest place in Stockholm at the moment. It's so nice to come to this tropical weather at the moment. I mean, it's minus 25 at the moment. So it's nice to come to a place where I can see the sun. So this is the outer shield. You see this gets down to around 50 Kelvin or so. And this is the, the base plate where all our, our iron optics sit on. And that's 14 Kelvin. And it's still 14 Kelvin. We also store some ions. This is one of the initial, uh, initial injections we had for storing 10 kV C minus, where we were storing for around 300 seconds or so. That's pretty reasonable. We still have ions in the ring. Background has been taken away. And then we did a little bit better. We, we stored for 30 minutes. So we were basically letting these ions go around, go around, and go around, and after 30 minutes we dumped them, and we see we still have ions in the ring. So we're currently optimizing this. All right, so first injections, this was in one of the rings, the, the light ion ring. We, this week, we're going to inject the same ions into the higher energy ring, just see so that everything is working as it should do. The handy platform will be finished next week, so we should be able to get positive ions into both rings and see if they work as well as positive as they do with negative. And maybe by, maybe by the 24th or 25th, you know, we'll open our presents and we have both anions and fat ions stored in the ring, but certainly by January 2013, which is the orthodox Christmas. So we win out of that. All right, that was all I wanted to say. That's the current status. So we're almost ready to provide theorists with high quality and the best data. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the C60 minus C60 plus, yeah. what does that look like energetically? Uh, those numbers are not off the top of my head. I would have to look at that one. I guess the fusion's not going to happen. I think there's a very small window there. Large molecules, if you look at C60, or I was thinking if you could do something like, let's say, uracil minus and uracil plus for the excimer, exciting state. So, so what uh, resolution would you have for products for this complex molecule selections? How are you going to determine those products? You mean in terms of number of products or what they actually are? What they actually are. Like you form this excited uracil plus, or what do you know? Okay. Uh, we have three sets of detectors. We have the detector which basically measures neutral particles, so that ones that basically don't, don't get deflected by the mm -hmm. first deflector. But we have secondary de detectors which pick up charge exchange fragments. So if you have charged products which are not the same as the parent ions, not parent ions, mm -hmm. ions. So if it breaks up into, let's say, a positive ion and, let's say, several neutral products, you can always try and do things in coincidence. In fact, we will be doing things in coincidence. So we can pick up one positive ion and see what neutrals came with that positive ion within, let's say, a few nanosecond time window. So we'll be able to do things in coincidence. I think that's where we will win. So as to how many it breaks up into, we don't know. Uh, our detectors, uh, the imaging detector can cope with that thing. I mean, we've had, you could probably get maybe 10 or 15 neutrals within, let's say, a 30, maybe a 200, 300 nanosecond window which we can resolve. And I guess we won't be getting some. Questions? So this is maybe a follow-up to Anna's question. So when you do this charge recombination, you're, you're forming some highly excited state, you're cascading down, probably through a manifold of states. Is there any chance of monitoring? So you're, you're seeing what happens ultimately. Yes. But in, in the reaction re region, you're probably getting this rapid decay down through the set of states. And 
that would be very useful to have information on that. I mean, one, I mean, one possibility, I'm not sure it will ever happen. I mean, you could use the electrodes, uh, we could maybe set some electrodes onto nothing or some other kind of potential where you could maybe suck away electrons or something and see how the electrons being formed at some point. Uh, we also have the possibility of throwing a photon beam or laser mm -hmm. in there. So maybe we could do laser assisted uh, processes whereby you come to a specific state before they actually go into the merging region, see what happens, turn the laser off and see if it as for monitoring things, that's tough. I mean, one of the things we have, we can vary the group energy, so maybe that's one way in which you can probe these things going on. Yeah, please. Uh, Sorry, I don't know. You get to very low collision energies and very low temperatures, but for some of these biomolecules, you may use an electrospray or something that could make these vibrationally excited. Um, are these vibrationally cold when you have the collision? Um, that's a tough question. Uh, I mean, 14 Kelvin is still, for a lot of molecules, a lot of energy. Uh, I'm not even sure C60 plus will be cold, really cold, at, at 14 Kelvin. Um, what you can always do, of course, is try and deliberately warm them up. So maybe throw, you know, make them absorb the photon or something and then see what happens. See if the rate changes or not, in a controlled way. Uh, one thing which I didn't mention but would be possible is we can control the temperature, of course, uh, at the coldest part. So we could warm things up to 20 Kelvin. So that would mean we, in principle, would know how many more photons we were throwing in deliberately from the environment and see if that makes a difference. So, so that means that you have actually, you can pull them better than Elisa can do. Because in Elisa's experiments, all their stuff is pretty important. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean we, we can, I mean, for those ions which have no dipole moment, of course, we can pre cool in our trap. So we can basically make them cold. Uh, the flight time from the trap into the storage ring is, is what? Probably a microsecond. So they will see a 300 Kelvin environment for very little time whatsoever before they get into the 10 Kelvin environment again. So we can make, we could in principle, if they, we know they're not going to cool down in the storage ring, we can basically control the temperature in the trap, in the pre trap, and deliberately inject. 500 Kelvin, no. 500 Kelvin ions into the ring, knowing they won't go back. Any questions? So if no questions, let's go to the next talk.